lovers. Welcome to Get Real, a podcast hosted by the National Animal Interest Alliance, through which we'll have deeply honest conversations about animal research so we can learn together and make compassionate choices about our medical future together. Welcome to episode six of Get Real. I'm Dr. Cindy Buckmaster, your host for Get Real. And today we're going to talk about something that's pretty intense and a little shocking. Uh, There are a few expletives in this one as well, so please keep that in mind if you're listening with children. You know, most of us love animals, and thinking about them being used for research hurts our hearts. And when someone tells us that animals are being tormented for pointless experiments by monsters who view them as objects rather than the precious living beings they are, we get angry and we take whatever action we can to stop them. But what if none of that is really true? What if research animals are actually treated with compassion, respect, and gratitude? And what if they are still necessary for the medical advances we want for ourselves and our loved ones. What if our love for animals has been exploited to manipulate us to carry out the wishes of a few at the expense of ourselves and our loved ones? Joining us again to explore this on a very personal level is Dr. David Yench, a prominent brain researcher who's known internationally for his studies on addictive disorders. Dr. Yench was the Associate Director for Research of the UCLA Brain Research Institute for many years and is currently the Director of Binghamton University's Brain and Body Imaging Research Center. In 2011, he received the award for Scientific Freedom and Responsibility from the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences to honor him for exemplary actions taken at a significant personal cost in order to foster scientific freedom and increase scientific awareness throughout the world. Welcome, Dr. Yench, and thank you again for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you coming on Get Real again. You know, we've we've had a few guests now uh, that have focused on brain research, and you are also a brain researcher. So I'm wondering if maybe you can highlight uh, what you've learned from your studies with animals about schizophrenia and addiction with our listeners. Thank you, Cindy, for asking me to share my research with your listeners. So first and foremost, uh, mental health disorders like schizophrenia and addictions are brain disorders, just like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And they're caused by a combination of genetic predispositions or inherited genetics and um, also adverse life experiences that sort of combine with one another to produce uh, the illnesses. Uh, The factors cause mental illness by disrupting the chemical interactions between brain cells and it's particularly the chemical interactions that allow for information processing in brain circuits that are affected in these conditions. And given the impact of these conditions on health and welfare, a lot of research, um, a lot of it in human subjects, healthy subjects and subjects with these disorders, as well as research in animals, um, focuses on really what systems in the brain are dysfunctional in these mental illnesses, as well as kind of how to reverse that dysfunction with potential treatments. My research focuses on um, the self-control circuits of the brain, which you discussed with Dr. London in your previous episode. Um, And I study how these circuits are related to addictive behaviors. So we know that the processes in the brain that give healthy people good control over themselves and their behavior The circuits that, for example, allow you to say no to that second drink when you have to drive home is dysfunctional in some people. And that impairment contributes directly to the fact that they may lose control over their drug or alcohol use and transition into an addiction. And in my research, we try to understand how the circuits of the brain, the cells of the brain, the molecules and the genes found in the brain affect self-control abilities and weaken those abilities in some individuals. So in my work, we've studied mice, we've studied rats, we've studied non-human primates, monkeys, and we've also studied human subjects. And we use a combination of techniques, including behavioral testing, non-invasive brain imaging, molecular analyses, looking at DNA and RNA and gene expression, direct studies of brain tissue, neural ablation techniques, and others. And one particularly important feature of our work is that some rodents and monkeys, just like some humans, find addictive drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine and nicotine and alcohol to produce pleasure. 
And as a consequence, they will voluntarily consume them just like humans do. So in the case of alcohol, many animals will willingly drink to achieve pleasure and intoxication. Um, in the case of a drug like cocaine, many animals will avidly learn to press a button to turn on a pump that gives them an intravenous dose of the drug. And this tells us that the brain circuits affected by these drugs are the same in humans and animals because the drug has the same behavioral effect, which you could call reward or reinforcement. Now, you'll note that I said many animals, not all animals, many animals will engage in the self-administration behavior. Just like in people, some animals will avoid drugs and alcohol because they don't find the effects as pleasurable, while others like it tremendously. Just like in humans, we've shown that animals with poor self-control are more likely to consume larger amounts of the drug, while animals with good self-control take less or abstain. And just like in people, genes play the biggest role in these individual differences, the difference between good self-control and abstinence and poor self-control and avid drug taking. And our goal is to use genetically diverse animal populations to find out precisely what genes give rise to this different self-control ability and to the resulting vulnerability for extreme differences in drug consumption. And the goal is to translate those findings into applications. That is to identify which molecules give some people good self-control and others poor self-control, and then to develop interventions that can target those mechanisms and help people assert or reassert control over their unhealthy substance use. So in some of our studies, we use mice because of these behavioral similarities, right? Mice drink alcohol just like people do. They have this similar relationship between self-control and alcohol drinking that people do. But as a model organism, mice have some limitations. Uh, the self-control circuits, which mostly reside in the frontal lobe, are tremendously expanded in the primate brain, which is why humans and other close relatives like non-human primates are much better at controlling ourselves than phylogenetically lower animals like rodents, dogs, and others. So in order to ensure maximal translation of findings from rodents to humans, non-human primates are often a critical element of animal research, and this has certainly been true in my studies. So in one example, it was known that humans suffering from various forms of substance addictions have a brain dopamine system that is abnormal. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that neurons use to communicate with one another, and this has been shown with a combination of brain imaging studies, as well as some studies of human brains that were collected after death. What we didn't know from the human studies were why those abnormalities occurred. One possibility is that the dopamine system was dysfunctional from early in life, and that's what really opened the door for an addiction to develop in that person. Another possibility is that the drug caused that abnormality. We also didn't know precisely what the functional significance of the dopamine system abnormality was. Like, does it actually cause the behavioral features of an addiction, particularly the loss of control over drug use that people suffering from addiction show? So to address these issues, we designed a research study involving non-human primates that examined self-control abilities and dopamine system function measured with brain imaging before and after they had experience with the addictive drug methamphetamine. And we found that methamphetamine exposure per se was sufficient to compromise the dopamine system and to erode their self-control abilities. And we found that these consequences were very long lasting. The monkeys received weeks of exposure to methamphetamine and these impairments last months. They lasted actually as long as we measured them in this particular study. But there was a really interesting thing. When we looked at the baseline data, the data that was collected before the drug was ever given, the precondition, we found that the few monkeys with the poorest natural self-control abilities already had a compromised dopamine system. Even though they had not yet experienced even one dose of the drug, their brains and their behavior in some ways looked like they did. Um, so this further supports the idea that drug experience damages the self-control circuits, which depend upon dopamine, but also that some individuals are highly vulnerable even before drug intake begins, likely due to the fact that they have genetic factors that compromise their dopamine system function and conferred upon them poor self-control. We're now trying to figure out what those genes are in our mouse studies. And to show the relevance of these chemical changes to behavior, it's been shown subsequent to our studies that directly targeting the dopamine system with medications can improve self-control abilities both in the animal model and in people with a substance use disorder. So these are the kinds of questions our studies are exploring. Um, our genetic studies in mice have actually already resulted in the discovery of new genes that um, likely influence self-control abilities but through programming dopamine system function. Um, the genes that we've discovered have essentially never been studied by neuroscientists previously. And so if these findings are confirmed, they could be major advances for the field. 
Wow. That was an amazing summary. And you don't know if when you experiment with that drug, right, what your genetic constitution is. You don't, you know, we don't come with a, a, an information card that tells us this, right? And, and no one's screening for that. So you really don't know, right? And so that first time that you try um, a drug that we know to be addictive could be defining the rest of your life. And you have no idea about that, which is astounding. And then coupled with that, uh, what you learned in your methamphetamine studies about uh, the dopamine system is that then the drug goes ahead and helps you out, right? <laughs> goes ahead and compromises the system even further, making it really, really um, close to impossible for somebody to exhibit the level of self-control they would need to stop using these drugs. I think it's amazing that you have now actually been able to identify some genes that uh, may be playing a role in this. Um, you know, and what would you imagine therapies could look like based on the things you're discovering right now? Well, there's a whole range of possible interventions that are available. Uh, they could be medications. They could be non-medication-based therapies, including altered life experiences that are contrary to the adverse life experiences that promote drug use. So, for example, in some of Dr. London's research, she's found that guided aerobic exercise can actually reverse some of the dopamine system function changes found in people with methamphetamine use disorder and suppress this craving. So both environmental and medication-based interventions can be targeted targeting these chemical systems in the brain to revert them and to improve um, sort of the prospect for abstinence. It's fascinating, and it gives me a tremendous amount of hope for all of those people out there suffering um, and their families struggling with this um, addiction. Thank you again for all the work you do. It's incredible, and I think it's going to make a huge difference in the quality of so many lives. But in the course of doing that work, you faced um, significant challenges from the extreme animal rights groups who are opposed to this work. I don't think our listeners really appreciate how much our researchers commit to this, you know, how strongly they feel about it, um, how much they sacrifice and how much they put on the line on a personal level in order to help the people around them to reduce human suffering. Um, so I wonder if you would take some time to summarize what you and several of your colleagues experienced earlier in your career when you were all working at UCLA together where Dr. London is currently. Sure. I was recruited to the faculty at UCLA in the latter half of 2001. And when I moved to LA, I was cognizant of the animal rights movement, of course, but I was less aware of the sort of extremist domestic terrorist fringe of the movement that used intimidation and violence against humans to achieve its goals. So at that time, animal rights actions in Los Angeles mostly included some on-campus protests that happened once or twice a year. And occasionally after the on-campus protest was over, um, they would spill over into the neighborhoods of a UCLA faculty member where they would protest against their research involving animals. And so for the on-campus protests, the campus police would monitor the crowd from beginning to end. But when the protests traveled to faculty homes, the researchers were left without any protection. And during these protests, members of the animal rights groups carried kind of graphic dated photos that have nothing to do with the work of the researcher they were targeting. Um, they would chant about them having blood on their hands. They would urge them to quote unquote, leave town. Uh, they sometimes passed out flyers to neighbors that included you know, personal details about the researcher, as well as a lot of deceptions and lies about the work, saying it was meaningless and useless, that it was inhumane. And not uncommonly, they'd get into shouting matches with the neighbors of the faculty and kids and pets in the neighborhood were frightened and stressed out. But this was sort of a regular occurrence at that time. Early on, I remember one particular neighborhood protest that was particularly shocking and distressing to me. One of the protests targeted um, the home of a septuagenarian couple who had actually already retired from distinguished careers studying the brain's vision system in monkeys. So they were not research active when this happened, but protesters showed up at their home. They gave their chance. They did their march in the street. They wore their masks. They threatened people. But in addition, they threw a brick through the window of the couple, which was tremendously frightening to both of them. And sadly, because because there were no police or security on the scene when it happened. No one was arrested for vandalism and the protesters eventually went home. Now between 2001 when I started and 2005, uh, the frequency and intensity of the demonstrations really started to grow and it started to grow out of control. 
So rather than once or twice a year involving a small number of faculty, it became many times a year targeting multiple faculty members. Demonstrations would often involve scores of individuals wearing masks, using bullhorns. They'd show up unexpectedly in protests sometime for hours in a direct attempt to intimidate the faculty member and their family inside the home. You couldn't escape your home when this was happening. You were really trapped there. Um, they would bang on the doors and the windows with their fists. They'd scream threats, vulgar insults. It was during some of these demonstrations that threats of arson and fire were first heard by faculty members. And what was sad was there was really no meaningful help from security or police. Um, police would show up reluctantly and do nothing because um, the protesters were claiming that the First Amendment protected their right to engage in this kind of vile behavior. The families being targeted were growing from being kind of scared to being fearful of their lives. And it was really um, that kind of transition of the insidiousness of these demonstrations that were really concerning. One of my colleagues had small children and their home was the target of many of the demonstrations. As a consequence of the demonstrations, the whole family was really suffering from fear and distress. And at one protest at their home, my colleague told me the fanatics began a special chant for them. And it was counting up the minutes since they arrived. One, one minute, two, two minutes, and eventually five, five minutes five minutes since we've arrived, no police here. Imagine what we could have done to you. So this was like a crescendo of harassment and intimidation. And it all came to a head in June of 2006 when a firebomb was left on the presumed front porch of a UCLA faculty member. It didn't ignite because the timer failed. And that was exceedingly fortunate because the device was erroneously left at the wrong address. It was placed on the porch of an elderly neighbor of the researcher. And so that person narrowly dodged really being collateral damage in this violent battle against uh, UCLA faculty. And a few days later, the Animal Liberation Front would claim responsibility for this attempted homicide. And to be clear, it was arson, but it was also a homicide. Anytime a person sets a home or a car on fire or makes an effort to do so, loss of human and animal life is a logical conclusion of that. And therefore, this is not just arson. This is attempted homicide. So in response to the attempted firebombing of that first home, uh, my colleague with small children publicly declared an end to their animal research. Their research focused on determining how the brain understands what we see, and they made this decision for the well-being of their family. The work that was stopped was basic research that was enormously significant. Not only did it have relevance to the development of treatments for the sight impaired, it offered new insights into how the brain cells compute information. And it actually has relevance for all the systems of the brain, the thinking systems, the feeling systems, the emotion systems. And so it was a tragic decision, but it didn't stop the extremists. Uh, approximately a year later, a firebomb was left under the car of a UCLA faculty member who was a medical doctor. He was a pediatric eye surgeon, but he also conducted animal research to develop novel treatments for childhood eye disorders like strabismus. Um, the bomb was lit, but it didn't ignite. Would it go on to be followed by a whole slew of nasty, vile home demonstrations in his neighborhood? And his spouse received a letter full of razor blades um, a few months after the attempted car bomb. And then just a few months later, in October of 2007, Dr. London's house was flooded by the extremists, who then returned in January of 2008 to leave an incendiary device on her front porch, which ignited and scorched the door. Um, and this was the first partially successful attempted arson that was carried out by the movement. So between June of 2006 and January of 2008, just 14 months, there were these multiple acts of attempted murder, of arson, of vandalism targeting UCLA researchers. But it turned out it was only the beginning. Uh, later in 2008, multiple UCLA carpool vans were burned or vandalized, and a car bomb destroyed two vehicles outside a woman's home. The attack was actually intended for a UCLA researcher, but once again, they made a mistake with the address and the actual owner of the vehicles, which were totally destroyed, um, was asleep inside the house at the time of the incident. So I was not a target of any of those actions at that time, um, but of course I was profoundly distressed for my colleagues and my friends who were being targeted by these attacks. And because it was very clear that the entire community of animal researchers at UCLA were starting to feel very anxious and fearful about what would come next. And after the first firebomb in 2006, I started working quietly within the university to demand better security for animal researchers. And one of the most salient outcomes of that process was that all the targeted faculty received very sophisticated security systems that were installed in their homes. Some received armed guards that were posted at their homes around the clock. And these things were absolutely necessary given the grave threats um, from these extremists. But of course, they were also exceptionally costly to the university. And ultimately, I presume to the California taxpayers who keep our institutions going. And as a faculty member who had not been targeted, I did not have these security systems or guards at my home. 
and that would change on a cold Saturday morning in March of 2009, just before four o'clock in the morning, somebody walked up into the yard in front of my house in which my car was parked um, and placed a device under the gas tank. And I awoke when the car exploded and the car alarm started shrieking. As soon as I opened my eyes and looked at the windows, I could see the orange color, the orange flames coming from below the windows. So I ran downstairs, asked my housemate to call 911. And by the time I got to the front door and opened it, the entire back half of the car was engulfed in flames. I ran to get a garden hose and started spraying the car. But at that point, the tires started exploding and I had to run back in the house. And as I was running away, the glass windows were blowing out because of the heat inside the car. I don't know if you've ever seen a car on fire. It's one of the most horrific and, and terrifying things um, you can see. It, it's just an overwhelming fire. So when the fire trucks arrived, which fortunately was about 12 minutes after we made the call, the car was entirely engulfed in flames. Um, the trees above my driveway had caught on fire uh, and the front of my house, which is a foot away from the car, was beginning to catch on fire as well. So it's hard to overstate just how much danger we were all in in this moment. I lived at that time in the Santa Monica Mountains above the UCLA campus. Uh, this is an area that you commonly see on the news with wildfires um, that rage and, and threaten people's and animals' lives. There's commonly wildfires. The wildfires are so severe that smoking outdoors is illegal in the neighborhood. You can't even get commercial fire insurance on your house if you live in this neighborhood because of the risk of wildfire. So whoever started that fire genuinely tried to kill me, but also attempted to kill the people who lived around me, my neighbors, whose houses were, you know, in some cases, just a score feet away. Uh, they also tried to kill my pets. I had two dogs in the house at the time. They also tried to kill the wildlife of the Santa Monica Mountains, which include a number of endangered and threatened species. And the only reason that didn't happen is that the fire trucks arrived so fast and put it out before it could spread further, which was extremely fortunate for all of us. Of course, I knew in the moment what was happening. Um, I knew at the moment I saw the fire. I remember running downstairs, mouthing to myself, they found me, they found me, they found me. And before the sun rose uh, that morning, my house was full, like literally full of 40 LAPD detectives and the FBI and the ATF. And we sat in my living room and they questioned me for hours. Um, they fingerprinted me in my own kitchen. Um, and then ultimately when the investigation was over, they left and they took the charred skeleton of the car with them um, as evidence. So, you know, later that morning I was sitting in my living room, honestly incapable of really thinking about what was going on or what to do next. But then I realized explicitly in my brain, somebody tried to kill me and they could come back. I had no protection. The police left by 10 o'clock that morning and I'm sitting there. The next few days were remarkably uh, traumatic. I didn't sleep for about 72 hours. Um, I couldn't sleep when the sun went down. I would stand in my bedroom window and look in the front yard and I was just constantly thinking they're coming back, right? Every movement was somebody coming back. I was basically, you know, in a constant state of panic from sundown to sun up, night after night after night. Eventually, uh, that following Monday, actually, I attempted to go back to work. Obviously, I wasn't going to get any good work done because I was in a, a fairly delirious state from lack of sleep. But I went back to work, and during that work day, I received a call from a police officer at UCLA letting me know that um, the Animal Liberation Brigade had publicly taken responsibility for the arson attack at my home. And in the email that was sent out or the, the news release that was sent out um, taking responsibility for the arson attack, they said, quote, David, here's a message for you. We will come for you when you least expect it and do a lot more damage than to your property. Wherever you go and whatever you do, we'll be watching you as long as you continue to do your disgusting experiments. So the police officer who called me told me you should go home now. Um, and by the time you get there, there will be armed guards at your home. And there were. I would go on to live with 24-7 armed personal security at home for many years after that occasion. So, you know, reasonably, I was tremendously overwhelmed with fear and panic. As I told you, I couldn't sleep. I, I constant fear that they were coming back. It was like the worst nightmare of my life. So, you know, that in addition to the fear, as I said, I wasn't sleeping. So delirium plus fear is not a good thing. I wasn't eating at the time. I was barely alive. And what made things worse was learning that in that subsequent week that there was going to be an on-campus animal rights protest just a month later. And assuming whoever attacked me wasn't arrested first, I assumed it was going to be likely that they would be on-campus protests marching against me on my own campus. And that's the first time that in addition to feeling fear, I really started to feel very angry about what was happening and what had happened and what was going to happen. 
I eventually returned to campus regularly. Um, the university provided me with security when I taught in a public classroom and when I held office hours. And once I returned, it was clear that the people around me were suffering badly because they were distressed over what happened to me. And again, because of the mounting cycle of violence that was being perpetrated against our community, um, that this was rising and it was trying to find new targets and maybe they could be next. And the kind of terrorism used against me was really intended to strike fear into the hearts of other animal researchers, and it did. It felt very important for me at that point in time once I had that realization to try to look beyond what I was experiencing and realize that the broader community of researchers were really suffering as a consequence of this. Sadly, the firebomb was not the end. Eventually, I relocated to another home because it was essential that I lived in a house that had better physical security to protect myself. It only took them about a month to find my new address. You know, we moved very surreptitiously, very quietly, but they found the new address. And in October of 2010, I received a letter in the mail at that house. The envelope was full of razor blades, and it, there was a letter inside that indicated um, that the razors were coated in, quote, AIDS blood. The letter also contained extraordinarily graphic threats um, that they were going to sneak up behind me and murder me by cutting my throat when I was out of the home. The previous experience I kind of suffered through alone. Um, this one was different. My parents were staying at my house at the time I got the letter. They were horrified and they had to watch you know, me go through stages of panic and fear and, and watching the arrival of another scrum of federal officers and police agents. And when an ALF related group called the Justice Department later claimed responsibility for the later letter, it also became a, a national news story. But the criminal attacks weren't their only tactics. Just a few weeks after the firebomb attack, they also began showing up in my neighborhood for protests against me. They were frequent, sometimes monthly. They were long, sometimes for hours, two, three hours at a time. And they were downright evil. They would scream epithets through bullhorns. They would chant. They would march. They shut down traffic in the street in front of my house. They fought with my neighbors. They tried to leave flyers with my personal details and with lies about me at a market just down the street from my house. And once, because of the news attention to what was going on, a reporter asked to visit my house during a protest so he could experience it himself, and he did. And during the protest, he reports them as the activist is screaming, David Yench, you cocksucking bastard, you sick pervert, I hope you die. And when the reporter interviewed the protest leader herself, she said, quote, wasn't Yench's car burned or something? I don't know how to put this. I only wish he had been in it, end quote. And so this shows the utter depravity of these protests. These are people that are claiming to march in defense of individual rights, but what they use are threats and savagery and bigotry to achieve their goals. And this went on for years, honestly. I endured this for years and years and years. How? It's just so vile and it's so terrifying and it's so, it lacks any appreciation for life of any kind. Um, and it's just, it really is evil, like you said. And how, how were you able to continue doing this work in the face of this? Obviously, in response to what was going on, I asked myself a lot of hard questions. Um, I asked myself questions like, is the work really worth this, accepting this level of attack and harassment? Is the work important enough um, for society? Am I the right person to be doing it? And so I went through a series of sort of self-inspections and I concluded ultimately that absolutely the work is, is necessary. It's essential that it be done, that the impact on human and animal life can be very great. And the world needs scientists to contribute their skills and talents to uh, research that can help people. And I felt that I really had an ethical obligation to continue the work because I had the skills and the knowledge um, that could adva advance our understanding of this, you know, life impairing disorder. And that also secondary to the research, but in tandem with it, as we're doing research, we're training the next generation of scientists. That's what professors like myself do. We don't just do research. We do research and we teach and we mentor. And just as important as making discoveries is making sure that 50 years down the road, there are people to take my place who will continue the work and I really ultimately decided that my obligation was to continue the research and my obligation was to make sure that there were well-trained scientists 10, 15, 50 years down the road so that we don't suffer from the lack of progress, that we don't suffer from the lack of new medications, new interventions that can be developed potentially by those scientists. And, and so ultimately, as I said, I believe that any one of us that has the skills and knowledge and abilities to conduct research that can really help people has an ethical obligation to do so. And I didn't think I had a choice. 
I thought I was obliged to do this. And this is more than just self-preservation. It's about making sure that the world can continue to benefit um, from scientists. Mm. Well, you're right. Not everybody can do this work. And you're incredibly selfless. And I'm sure that many of our listeners feel the same way. And I'm absolutely certain that your colleagues feel the same way. I have a question for you. Um, these are criminal actions. <laughs> was there any intervention by, by law enforcement? Was, was anything done? So law enforcement, of course, did respond when the car was bombed. And when I received the letter, um, there were these were federal crimes. And so there was the involvement of both local police as well as federal agents. The federal criminal investigations were opened by the FBI in response to both of those events. Um, I worked with a team of agents who were assigned to the case. They interviewed me repeatedly about my experiences and what happened. Um, unfortunately, all the cases were closed with no prosecutions. When you're a victim of a federal crime, you get a, a nice one-page letter in the mail saying, we're the FBI and we've opened a case about a, a crime that you experienced. About four years to the day after I got that letter, I got a letter from the FBI saying, we're sorry, we never found anything, no one was prosecuted, and your case is closed. And so getting a letter in the mail from the FBI saying it's over was really hard, I have to be honest. I felt pretty let down by the system. None of the other crimes that targeted other faculty were solved either. And one gets the impression that solving these cases of domestic terrorism at the time weren't the highest priorities. Now, with respect to the home protests, the activists did actually engage in illegal behavior during them for many years. Um, there were city ordinances about the use of amplified sound, which are obviously disruptive to the peace, as well as marching in close to the house. There's a municipal law that requires a minimum distance of spacing between the protesters and the residents, and they violated both of those laws for many years. Eventually, as a result, police did arrest a handful of protesters in front of Dr. London's house for those actions, and it had an effect on them for a while. But eventually, they returned to not only protesting, but to breaking the law during those protests, and they were never arrested again. So I'd have to say, overall, the law enforcement response to these extremist actions was pretty disappointing. What, what were they really trying to accomplish? I mean, was there something particular about you and your colleagues and the work you were doing that made you targets? Or do you believe there's just a larger agenda? I mean, what were they after? I think definitely there's a larger agenda. As an individual inside the institution, I can tell you that um, the people that were selected for harassment and attack appeared quite random. There was one factor that brought several of us together, and that was that non-human primates were involved in our research. It was really opportunistic. The goal was to make animal researchers broadly fearful, to inflict terror into their hearts, um, to scare researchers and their families. In fact, when a new segment was done on the protests in LA and the protesters were interviewed, they said so themselves. They said, this isn't about monkeys. I'd be here if it was a frog. I'd be here if it was a fish. I'd be here if it was a rat. Um, this is not about monkeys. It's about animal research. And the final goal of all these people is the total abolition of all forms of animal research. And these activities have been effective. As I told you, one of my colleagues did cease their research. Other researchers around the country have retired from their jobs as a consequence of being targeted. And do you think it's because they really don't understand the biological conservation across species that informs treatments and cures? Do you think it's just they, they don't understand why animals and research are valuable? It's hard to put myself into the mind of these people, to be honest. The behavior is so vile and so irrational that to understand it, you actually have to lose some sense of your own decency and, and logic. I try not to understand how someone can get to a point where they would try to kill another human being for doing their job, where you would stand in the street and you would yell epithets at somebody because you don't like the work that they do, where you would frighten kids that live in a house because they happen to be the children of somebody who's a scientist. There's essentially no way I can come to understand how that kind of behavior can happen. It's really difficult. I'm not talking about every animal rights activist in the world. I'm talking about the groups that engage in this level and kind of activity, this kind of personal targeting behavior. It's hard to explain it at all unless you really think deeply that there must be some serious psychopathology in the group that leads to this. Yeah. But one of the things that happened is that you were inspired yourself to uh, try and demystify animal research for the public. Maybe you can talk a little bit about those efforts because they're, they're admirable. 
first and foremost, as I as I already indicated, I felt a big responsibility to kind of turn my attention away from my personal experiences, sort of self-preservation, and try to address the fear and the anxiety that people were feeling as a consequence of what happened to me. I actually felt a real responsibility to do that. Uh, I wanted to make people feel safe. I wanted to make people feel unified in our, our collective scientific mission and really reinforce the scientific community that was suffering. And as I mentioned earlier, an on-campus animal rights protest was planned about a month after the bombing of my car. And it just occurred to me that this was a real opportunity to try to address the pain that the community was feeling. So together with some colleagues, I planned a pro-animal research counter demonstration that would happen on the same day as the anti-animal research demonstration. And what I thought was going to be 50 animal researchers marching against an equal number of animal rights proponents really ended up being about 1,000 animal research supporters facing up to about 20 or so animal rights protesters. They promptly packed up their stuffed monkey and left while we went on and held a very powerful and unifying assembly that recognized and reaffirmed the importance and the significance of the work we were doing. And a lot of media was attracted to the event that day. And so we spent some time talking with the media and in turn the public about what animal research was being done at UCLA and the advantages that were coming from it and what the mechanisms were for regulating and ensuring that it's responsible and humane. And after that event, I wanted to use other online efforts like um, the Speaking of Research website and my own blog, Unlikely Activist, to share examples about the merits of animal research and the vile and the hateful nature of some segments of the animal rights community so that the public could understand these things. And as I said, I continued to try to engage broadly with the public through the media to discuss uh, the crucial and responsible nature of the kinds of research that we were doing. Yeah. You know, they say folks that rest their, their, their feet on the shoulders of giants, right? And uh, and I consider you one of my giants. Um, your efforts and everything you went through certainly inspired me in my quest to also help to demystify research, which is, uh, which is partly why we're here today on Get Real, right? So uh, thank you so much for all of that. I want to move to another point here. Um, so this all happened back in the 2000s, um, where you had this really, really extreme fringe that um, that was very, very violent, and nothing happened to them, which is astounding. And uh, I guess that's concerning because um, I don't see it, that there's anything uh, stopping it from happening again. But but it hasn't, thankfully. I mean, the nature of the threat has seemed to switch more to that really intense harassment, um, the kind of stuff that's happening to Dr. Elizabeth Murray, right, at the NIH. Pete has created this enormous campaign around her uh, that's baseless in, it, in its foundation. But nevertheless, uh, they have a lot of people uh, sort of joining them in, in harassing her everywhere at work, at home. I mean, a lot of what you had dealt with, right? And, you know, so do you feel that this current movement, which is less violent, um, at least for now, do you think it still presents the same danger to medical advances in this country? Setting something on fire is a very salient example of violence, of physical violence. Uh, sending somebody razor blades in the mail is a very salient example of physical violence. But years of stalking and harassment, although they may be less salient, are absolutely psychological violence. Make no mistake about it. These are violent attacks on somebody's mental well-being and their humanity. Um, and these are the tools that animal rights activists are using today. And I think we should be very careful to acknowledge and fully appreciate the hideous violence that's involved in this harassment, the stalking, the home demonstrations, and then the, the ongoing nature of it. Multiple researchers have been targets of these kinds of activities today, um, including Betsy. These campaigns of lies and misinformation, as well as the direct action demonstrations in the neighborhoods, in my opinion, are violent acts, and they can do lasting damage to careers, to the reputations of institutions that we work at, and to all of us. One of the most critical tasks for a scientist is to ensure that while making discoveries that benefit the world, we train the next generation of scientists that I've already talked about so that the work can continue. We need scientists 50 years from now or we're going to be in big trouble. And when young people see senior researchers being targeted and harassed by this psychological violence, it causes them to ask themselves whether this is the right career path for them or whether they should take a different one. The animal rights groups know this. A few years ago, they even mounted a campaign to have people expose graduate students working in animal research for prize money. You can see the machinations that are driving these activities. They want to make senior researchers and trainees fearful and make other choices. 
And I've talked with many students who are worried about their futures as animal researchers. And if the campaigns of physical and psychological violence continue, I fear that we, and by we I mean now the whole world, are going to lose some awesome researchers that we need. So where would the world be today if Malin DeLong, the Parkinson's disease researcher we discussed in episode four, made a different choice? Where would we be if Betsy Murray had made a different choice? Where would we be if the 180 Nobel Prize winning animal researchers had chosen a different path? We'd be in a world of hurt. We'd have lost access to vital and life-affirming research. And today, that risk still continues because of this insidious harassment that I call psychological violence. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, psychological violence is, uh, is a good term for it. And I think, um, you know, I can imagine that anybody who's dealing with this all the time and, you know, you're not safe in your own home and your neighbors are getting leaflets about you and you can't go to a bus stop without seeing something about you. I mean, at some point, I imagine you're afraid to walk around your own block, right? Or go to the mailbox, for goodness sake. It is absolutely life changing. You know, you, right? Where would we be if, if you decided to leave science, right? I mean, all of you folks who are doing so much for us, and most of us don't even know you're doing it, right? We don't, we don't understand everything that goes into bringing people the treatments and cures they continually demand every day, right? You know, for themselves and their loved ones, including their pets. They, they don't really know. I mean, I think we've brought some of that to light. People are starting to understand that, you know, treatments and cures don't just fall from the sky. And, uh, and it requires a lot of foundational research to understand how biological systems work in the first place and that there just simply are things we cannot understand and identify without working with animals because we're simply not either allowed to do that with people or it's just impossible because the technology is not there. You know, so without the research community, without biomedical researchers, you're exactly right. Where would we be? I mean, I guess we would just be where we are now and that's it. And I don't know what we tell parents with children who have, you know, muscular dystrophy and other terminal diseases that they're just watching, you know, wither away in front of their eyes. What do we tell those people? We know that other researchers um, that didn't withstand the sort of violent attacks that you have, but were targeted in, in much the same way that Dr. Murray's been targeted, have left science. We know they have. Um, there's a very prominent researcher in muscular dystrophy who left. Uh, there's a very prominent brain researcher who left. And, uh, you know, and then we have a very prominent brain researcher who's just taken his studies to China. I mean, so they either leave completely or they, they go to another country. And I believe in the value of collaboration, but I also would like for the regulations related to how we care for animals to be somewhat standardized worldwide, you know, and it's all very concerning to me. I'm just so grateful that you're okay and uh, and that you decided to continue to do this work and then to speak up. Obviously, the public doesn't understand this, right? Or they wouldn't be supporting this. That's the thing. This movement is supported and empowered by people who believe what they're saying. And we've got to get the real information out there to them so that they can understand what the truth is and understand the real consequences to their own well-being for not knowing the truth. Because when they support these movements, that means they support the misinformation that comes from them which means uh, that they then vote in support for the legislators who have also been misinformed to enact legislation that is going to have a very, very horrific consequence for medical advancement and human and animal well-being in the future. Yeah, I think that's right. So I think it's really important for us in this conversation to reflect on the fact that not all animal rights activists are extremists. Many people genuinely love animals, and they've come to believe, thanks to lies and propaganda and deception from the national animal rights organizations, that animal research is useless and cruel. And because they've come to believe that, they do what feels right and oppose our work. And what these people need is true information, information about the humane nature of responsible animal research, true information about how much researchers love animals and humans and are working to preserve all of our lives, true information about the transformative benefits of animal research, true information about how much animal research promises to benefit human and animal kind in the future. Yeah, that is incredibly well stated. I couldn't agree more. Dr. David Yanch, you are strong, brilliant, selfless, so loving. Uh, thank you for sharing so much of your personal story with us. I'm sure it was difficult to go through that again, but I think it was really important for our listeners to hear and understand. And um, I'll offer you uh, an opportunity to close with any other comments you may have. 
No, I just want to thank you, Cindy, for the opportunity to get the true information I was just talking about out to the public. Um, I think that's an important effort you know, in this podcast. And so thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, let's dig a bit deeper. While it is absolutely true that research with animals is highly regulated and that research animals are cared for by animal lovers who are specially trained to address their physical, social, and behavioral needs, as well as minimize any pain or distress they may experience on study. The truth is that all diseases cause some level of suffering, and we have to make some research animals sick in order to learn how to treat and prevent disease in others. The question is, is it ethical for us to do this? Is it ethical for us not to do this when so many people and animals worldwide continue to struggle with debilitating illnesses? These are intensely personal considerations, and most of us don't spend much time in this space. But we need to sort out our feelings and values about this, and we need to be deeply honest with ourselves, or we can't truly be loving to people or animals moving forward. You'll have opportunities to reflect on all of this more deeply across the next two episodes of Get Real. You can check for announcements by following us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm Dr. Cindy Buckmaster, your host for Get Real, and I'm grateful to all of you for joining us today. If this podcast has shaped your understanding of public health and the involvement of animals in research, please become a Get Real monthly supporter. Your donation will help us continue to bring honest content to everyone who benefits from medical advances. We all deserve to know the facts. You can become a supporter and learn more about how research animals are truly cared for by visiting our website at getrealpodcast.info. I also recommend that you check out the Lab Rat Chat podcast for more information about research animals and how they're actually treated. You'll learn a lot from Jeff and Danielle and have a few laughs while you're at it. We'll talk soon. 